Hey everybody, welcome to Managing Risk with De Device Controls on Mac. Removable storage devices continue to be a staple end user technology and enable key user workflows and productivity in most organizations. However, in many cases, these devices can provide real risk and present real and present risk to the organization in how they're used. In this session, we're going to discuss what the risk is, what native and third-party options are available for controlling device usage, and recommended considerations in developing your device control strategy. I am Carrie Lundberg. I'm the product owner on Jamp Protect. Along with product management and strategy folks, as well as the development teams, we work on identifying and developing new features and functionalities in Jamp Protect. Hey folks, I'm Matt Taylor. I am a systems engineer focused on the security side of our product uh, portfolio, and I work closely with our customers, our partners, and the Jam Protect product team to help Jam build and serve the best endpoint security product that we can. So in today's session, we're going to look at what device controls are. We'll look at what devices are out in the world that you need to be aware of, such as USB thumb drives, SD cards, mobile devices, and other external devices that could potentially connect to endpoints. We'll get you thinking about what device controls and impacts, what about device controls and impacts to your environments and endpoints. Then we'll help you understand what risks are out there and give you some real examples of inbound risks, which could result in malware that could get into your environment, outbound risks, which could result in data loss, and organizational risks, which such as regulatory and compliance requirements in highly regulated environments. After that, we'll explore options available for mitigating the risks. There are a variety of options and opportunities to consider, and opportunities to layer risk mitigation from MDM to Apple native functionality to using Jamp Protect's device control feature. In this section, we'll also take a tour of Jamp Protect's device control functionality so you can see how it is configured and its flexibility to support many different use cases in device controls. And finally, we'll give you some ideas and considerations for choosing a device control strategy that works for your situation. We'll wrap up this presentation with some questions and considerations for you to think about when you're developing device control policies for your own organization. You'll want to develop a strategy based on your organization's unique needs and workflows, which may or may not include use of devices and protect your endpoints from risks associated with unauthorized use of devices. So first, let's talk about what is device control. USB devices are a convenient way to store and move data, but while extremely easy and available for use, if the right controls are not in place, using devices can also open your organization to risk. We know many users in many environments need access to devices to perform day-to-day -day work tasks, such as transferring large data files or handing off data securely. And that's just regarding removable storage devices. N not the many of other types of devices users are commonly want or need to use in their daily operations. More recently, cloud storage solutions have reduced the need for devices over time, but they're not a perfect solution. Some aren't able to be used for secure data transmission and they aren't ideal for larger files. Usage of USB and other devices are core to staying productive for many users in many roles, but consequently create a highly available and broad attack surface across your managed endpoints. If a user can insert or use a device on their endpoint, there is potential risk. The broader the attack surface, the larger the potential risk, and the more thoughtful we need to be with the policies and solutions we put into place for mitigating that risk. Policies and solutions are commonly called device control. They effectively, they are effectively a protective measure that allow an IT or security team to monitor and control the use of devices on endpoints in their environment with the main goal of ensuring, ensuring that only safe devices are used on approved, used in approved circumstances. Let's look at some of the risks to be aware of as you're considering device control policy for your organization. So inbound risks, these are risks your device, your network, and ultimately your business sh should malicious files be introduced to your environment by a removable storage device. 
Malicious files are malware, which tend to be an executable that is disguised in some way to trick the user into launching it, such as a PDF or a document. A couple of common examples where social engineering attacks can be powerful and enabled through bad devices. They're similar to popular phishing techniques via email, where users get a communication asking for review or validation of important business information, financial data, or similar. Um, a couple of examples of that, uh, maybe USB devices left in the parking lot of targeted business that employees find and plug into an endpoint out of curiosity to find out who, might, who it might belong to and potentially introduce malware to their environment. Or recently in the news, USB drives were mailed to targeted companies or industries by malicious actors with information and directions that look legitimate but when inserted, got hacking groups access to target networks to deploy ransomware. Outbound risk. This is a risk of loss or threat, theft of business critical information, employee or customer data, trade secrets, or otherwise that someone can access and put on an unsecured or unimproved removable storage device, whether it's done inadvertently or maliciously. I've got a couple of high profile situations in recent history both of which appear to be inadvertent, but be aware of nonetheless. Um, I think probably everyone has heard um, in June 2022, 2022 the, the guy in Japan who lost an entire city population's personal data after a night of drinking when his stuff was stolen. It included names, birth dates, and addresses, as well as tax details, bank account numbers, and people receiving social security. Uh, fortunately, the drive was encrypted and password protected, and to date, the missing information hasn't surfaced anywhere. And another example was in October 2017, a USB device was found in the streets of London. It contained maps, videos, and documents, including details for protecting the queen, and the device was unencrypted. Because the device was unencrypted, the person who found it was able to get all the details off the device, had the organization had some kind of an encryption policy in place, this could have been prevented. Another outbound risk is the introduction of a malicious device that can steal data from an endpoint. This is known as rubber ducky used by a malicious actor. It looks like a USB device, but it's quickly able to get critical information off the endpoint, such as cached passwords. And now a new, more sophisticated version of this ducky can run a test to see if it's been plugged into a Windows endpoint or a Mac endpoint, and then condition, conditionally execute software, execute code appropriate to one or the other. And the last risk we are looking at is organizational risks. Some industries such as government, healthcare, and financial organizations have higher regulatory requirements that they need to meet, including limiting use of devices. The organizational risk for not complying with those regulations are potential security and or financial risks associated with, with that for the business. Examples of a compliance framework requiring controls are the GDPR in Europe and CCPA, which is the California Consumer Privacy Act, both of which require devices be encrypted when used in environments impacted by these regulations. We've also heard from customers that there are device control requirements sometimes found in policies for their cyber risk insurance. First step in tackling the risk of devices is understanding what devices are being used on your endpoints today. And if you were to conduct an audit of the different devices used within your organization, our expectation is that you would encounter uh, quite a wide array, some provided by your IT team, but many likely not. And we're looking at how we can offer some visibility into this from a Jamf Protect product perspective, but in our experience, the most common devices found are removable storage devices of some kind whether that be a USB thumb drive, uh, SD cards, or uh, Thunderbolt drives, as these devices tend to be readily available and most often enable productivity, especially for certain roles or departments. However, we also see many users connecting their phones, whether to you know, charge them or see data from them, or accessories like keyboards and mice through the USB port. Print is also still you know, very, very commonplace in the workplace, uh, as is usage of wireless transfer tools like AirDrop and Bluetooth. And, each of these device types and more that we uh, don't actually have listed here 
present their own risk profile and should be considered within the context of your environment and users. Now, the, what we're going to do is really, uh, for the purpose of this presentation, focus solely on removal storage devices, mobile phones and tablets and accessories, as these are arguably the most commonly used and therefore the greatest potential risk surface. Now that we know the device types that we're discussing in the presentation, let's take a closer look at actually what we want to do with these devices. Now, in general, there are two actions that we want to undertake with regards to a device. First of all, we may want to monitor the devices that are being used and what's actually taking place during the time that it's connected to the endpoint. This might be perhaps passive monitoring in order to keep the record of all devices and associated activity for auditing, uh, for proactive threat hunting, or reactive incident response. We then may want to take this a step further and implement controlling actions, which might involve limiting the access the user has to that device when it's connected, or what the device itself can do automatically, such as the case that we heard earlier, or potentially even blocking the device entirely. Now, in, in order to do uh, either of these uh, in the kind of context that we're talking about, we need something on the Mac to serve as an intermediary and allow us to take uh, actions. And that might be something natively within the operating system. It might be something that we've deployed through management, or in this case, we'll use JamProtect in this example, which is using the native endpoint security framework on Mac OS to achieve both monitoring and controlling actions based upon policy defined in JamProtect Cloud. Now, what are the actual events and activity that we want to monitor or control? Well, first of all, we have hardware insertions, which is literally the types of hardware that are being connected and the protocols they're using. Uh, this information can be used to determine what the device is that's connected and you know, do any policies that we have deployed onto that machine uh, apply uh, to that device. Next, we have volume mounts, whereby we're able to determine what the volume is, uh, is, the, is the volume of the device actually encrypted or not in order to uh, satisfy any override rules we have in place inside that policy. Third, we have uh, any file system activity that is undertaken once that device is connected. Now, a good example of this is JamProtect's detection of when file writes and changes are made from the Mac to a USB, therefore giving us visibility of files that are moving from the endpoint onto an external storage drive. And finally, we have process activity. The best example here is that we may wish a user uh, the ability to read files from a USB to achieve a certain task, such as the transfer of a large file, but not the ability to actually run where that is located on that device as a protective mechanism. In this case, we could limit the device to read only, so the user can still read the data and pull it off onto their Mac, but in read-only mode, JamProtect will also prevent processes from being launched from that device. And the combination of both monitoring and controlling actions with these different, you know, we'll call them data feeds, can really make for pa uh, powerful capabilities. So we've covered, you know, what device control is, the risk that we're aiming to mitigate, and why organizations should consider implementing a strategy. Let's now take a look at the technology Apple and Jamf provide for doing so. And there are really three options that we're going to talk about in the context of today's presentation. The two options on the screen there uh, for managing devices are available through Jamf Solutions, first through MDM with Jamf Pro on the left, and second the framework on more modern macOS versions using the device controls feature of Jamf Protect. Thirdly, we'll also look at how the new accessory security feature included in the upcoming macOS Mentura release offers organizations a new range of user-driven capabilities to help address risk. Now, it's important to note that these are not the only solutions available to customers and community. Uh, there definitely are other solutions out there, but we're gonna look at this through the lens of macOS native and Apple first technologies. So let's dive in. Now we'll start with controls available through MDM, mobile device management, uh, looked at through the lens of Jamf Pro. And there are two key facts that are important to know about this option upfront. Uh, as this capability is made possible through the MDM framework built into macOS, which Apple provides as a part of the operating system, it's therefore possible for any MDM solution to offer this value to customers. So when I'm looking at this through Jamf Pro, I'm doing that for, you know, the fact this is a Jamf presentation, but you should be aware that if you're using another MDM, you also have some, or you likely also have some of these capabilities. Secondly, and most importantly, uh, this capability was actually deprecated in macOS Big Sur, meaning that although in some circumstances it still worked on that operating system and continues to do so in earlier ones, this is, 
light on as we look to the future of managing devices and mitigating risk. And just a, a, going to pause for a call out here. Uh, please, please ensure that your endpoints are uh, up, uh, kept up to date to the latest version. You know, the most uh, secure operating system is considered to be the latest, and it really is critical that a patching strategy is, is in place to allow you to be agile in this area. Uh, having said that, it's not a perfect world, and there are likely going to be devices in a lot of environments running outdated OS versions. So it might still be useful to be aware of this to have some controls put in place for mitigation while you then work towards uh, a patch and workflow and implementation. Now, what is it, right? So the allowed media management keys available in the MDM framework allows an organization to control how both hard disk media and uh, more traditional disk media are able to be used on the endpoint. Now that means internal and external drives, disk images like DMGs, CDs, and DVD disks, uh, and more. And while this isn't comprehensive in today's uh, world, I would say it does cover a broad array of the more the most common and perhaps traditional hardware and software types that allow a user to place data on or take data off of a Mac. Now there are separ uh, several strengths that make this solution attractive for supported OSs. First of all, the controls are enforced through MDM, meaning users are unable to bypass them on managed Macs that have system integrity protection enabled. Variations of the controls can also be enforced at both the system level for all users or through the user channel for specific users conditionally, allowing you, allowing you to control how widely you actually want to enforce those controls. Media can be blocked entirely, uh, mounted as read-only, meaning you can only take data off of the device and onto the Mac and not vice versa, and even authentication of an admin being required to interact at all. Now, aside from the lack of support for recent macOS versions, there are other considerations to be aware of with this solution. There is no capability to build contextual overrides of the default rules, meaning that if the control is set to prevent all external disk media, you have the ability to mark a certain disk or scenario uh, as approved. While this might be acceptable for some use cases, it, it can create friction for others. So organizations that need that more flexible control uh, are probably looking at something else rather than this. Only the aforementioned media types are supported with no controls available for other types of devices that a user might connect. And there's no possibility of customizing the messaging shown to end users when the policy is enforced and a disk is blocked, uh, which can be actually quite a useful tool that can help reduce end user friction when navigating these controls on their endpoint. In some, while this feature isn't supported in the most uh, recent macOS releases, there really still is some fantastic controls available to implement mitigation of risk on certain uh, endpoints that have that eligible operating system and for certain device types that are supported. Moving on to accessory security. Now, this is a new feature coming in macOS Ventura, and at the time of this recording, the upcoming OS from Apple is still in beta. And this means that we're somewhat limited in what we're able to show and talk about, uh, but it, it should be noted that features of uh, beta releases may also be changed or removed prior to release. Uh, we do, however, have some visibility that we're able to share today, and happily, because this new feature is a fantastic step forward in enabling and educating users to learn more about how devices they insert into their Macs should be considered carefully. Now, the premise of this feature is simple. Every time a user connects a device of some sort to their Mac, whether that be a storage device, a keyboard, or even an, an adapter, you know, things considered to either be storage or an accessory, there is the ability to require the user to confirm that the device is able to connect. The, the user is prompted with the notification you see on the screen there, and they must explicitly allow that connection seemingly before the operating system is able to really interact with it in a meaningful way. And that really comes back to some of the implementation details that we'll see become clearer as we get closer to release. There are, there are some details worth reading into about how the user prompts work and how the approvals persist. Uh, more information will be available in those uh, data release notes and as we go forward into production. Uh, but from what we know so far about this feature, there are some key strengths in how it, how it actually does operate. Device support extends further than the uh, traditional storage devices that we commonly see and that we were covering in the previous uh, example, instead also covering accessories that connect over USB-C into the Mac. Uh, we don't have a clear understanding of the exact coverage yet, but in testing, this does appear to be traditional media, uh, adapters, accessories like keyboards, and other devices that you might see in this vein. The feature can be managed by the user inside system preferences, 
and configured with different levels of control uh, from requiring user approval every time at certain intervals or to simply allow the connection by default. And you can see that little menu on the screen there. There is even an MDM key available, actually a pre-existing key that I, I believe was available for iOS that's going to be now uh, able to be used on macOS. Uh, although it's worth noting, it doesn't actually offer enforcement of a block policy, but it actually allows you to effectively disable uh, a user setting this up in a blocking mechanism. There are also some key considerations to be aware of for accessory security. The feature is only available on Apple Silicon devices as documented today. Uh, that are running macOS Ventura or later, meaning that older Mac hardware and operating systems are unable to leverage these capabilities. By design, this feature is user-driven, which is definitely a positive in many ways and in line with both you know, the Apple and the Jamf ethos of empowering and putting users first. Uh, but this may not meet the requirements of some organizations that are highly regulated. Further testing is needed, but initially it does appear that user approvals of the uh, uh, prompts of the device actually do uh, interact differently whether the user is connecting the device directly into the port or perhaps through an adapter. And the end user uh, messaging, at least with the information that we have today, appears to, uh, to be hard coded, therefore not able to be customized and not able to be kind of branded for your different purposes. And really in summary, it's fantastic to see Apple taking this approach and offering users some greater visibility and control in how devices are connecting to their Macs. And we're, Really quite excited to see how this feature grows in future macOS releases. I'll now hand back over to Carrie, who can look at device controls with Jam Protect. Thanks, Matt. Uh, now let's take a walk through the device controls feature in the Jam Protect application. You can configure a policy or policies that meet the needs of various user groups or workflows within your organization. Protect's strengths are that you can set up an all-encompassing device control policy that can block all removable storage devices or limit them to read-only. This offers a highest level setting for any device usage on your network in the policies you craft, which you can further customize with override rules, which we'll discuss in a second. It's supported for macOS Catalina and later. Uh, running the latest macOS is considered to be the best security practice, but we know that that is not always the case. Due to this, it's important to have device control that supports a range of operating systems running on your endpoints. There are versatile override rules to limit based on encryption status or vendor, product, or specific devices based on their serial number. Not only that, the feature can be deployed and managed on a per user or per group basis. This combined with override rules ensures that you can implement the right policies for the right users. End user notifications can be custom to suit your organization's needs and messaging requirements. The way we communicate with end users in the world of security is so important. We need to achieve our desired layers of security, but in a way that doesn't jeopardize end users' experience with their devices. For example, if we only want to permit encrypted devices and a user inserts an unencrypted USB device, we can communicate to them through the notification to explain why their device cannot be used and also direct them to internal resources or tooling to help encrypt their device and get them back to a productive state. Please be aware that the device controls apply to removable storage devices only at this time, which includes removable storage devices such as USB, like thumb drives, uh, SD cards for both Intel and Silicon Macs, and or external SD card readers that connect over supported USB protocols. Uh, just a quick note that the screen on the right shows what the device controls configuration looks like we'll have a deeper look in just a moment. But first, let's look into some possible configuration scenarios. Device controls in Jam Protect are created to be incredibly flexible to capture many variations in how an organization may want to configure and implement their device control strategy. This helps you mitigate risk where you can and enable productivity where it's needed. Let's look at some device control configuration scenarios. The first scenario, the user inserts a USB device on an endpoint. Jam Protect recognizes a USB device has been inserted and validates it against the permissions configured. In this instance, there either isn't a device control policy set on a plan, or if there is a policy, 
the de default permissions for the device control is set to read and write. The user is able to continue ahead using their device and being productive. Be aware that as an admin, you will see an alert that a USB device was inserted on one of your endpoints. We'll look at alerts in an upcoming slide. Next, let's look at another configuration scenario. A user again inserts a USB device on an endpoint. JamProtect recognizes a USB device has been inserted and validates it against the permissions configured. Here, and End users will see a pop-up notification that the device they inserted is limited because the default permission for device control is set to read only. We'll see a pop-up in the demo with messaging in just a moment. Also note, any file execution from a USB device in read only will be prevented. This is very important to keep malicious files from executing in your environment. And again, admins will see an alert that a USB device was mounted as read only. Here we are again, a, a, a user with a different configuration scenario enters their USB device and Jamf Protect recognizes and validates against the permissions configured. Here, the end user will see a pop-up notification that the device inserted is not allowed because the default permission for the device is set to prevent. Admins will also see an alert that the USB device was prevented. And we have one last device control scenario to look at, which dives into how flexible Jam for Text device control functionality really can be. Here again, user in, inserts a USB device on an endpoint, and Jam for Protect recognizes the USB and validates it against permissions configured. Here, an end user will see a pop-up notification that the device inserted is either not allowed or read-only, depending on the default permission configured as we looked at. And additionally, Jamf Protect has override rules to really make our device control functionality flexible to meet many, many use cases. Override rules can be added to bolster a default, a default permission set. They can be created on encryption state on the device or help you limit device usage in your environment to a specific vendor, a specific product, or as granular as allowing or preventing specific devices based on serial number. Some examples to think about. Maybe you only want encrypted devices used in your organization's environment to risk data loss. Or perhaps your organization buys a device model or brand in bulk. You can use our device controls to limit to just those kinds of devices. Or maybe you're in, in your environment, there are specific devices that should be allowed and no other devices can be used. You can upload a list of approved device serial numbers to the application to allow those and any other devices will be prevented. In addition to adding override rules, you can layer override rules together, such as adding your approved list of devices by serial number and also ensuring that they're encrypted when inserted into your environment. In the next slides, we're gonna walk through configuring device controls and protect so you can see what those settings look like in the application and how to set them up. This screen, you'll see, you'll see when you choose device controls on the left navigation and then choose to create a removable control storage control set or edit an existing one. On this screen, you can see this is, has a policy with the default permission of prevent in the upper right corner. You can set the name and description for the policy and the default lo local notification message that an end user would see in their pop-up. And here's where the flexibility for Jam Protects device controls comes into play with its co configuration versatility. Towards the middle of the screen, you can override rules and permissions for your device controls policy by clicking the Add button. A modal pops up, and you can select several types of override options that you might want to apply. Uh, what you see here are the override types available. So encrypted devices limits the use based on an encrypted status of the device. Vendor ID is a vendor that manufactures the device, such as like a SanDisk or Kingston. The serial number is the unique serial number of a specific device. And product ID is the specific model of a device, such as a Kingston Data Traveler or Kingston Data Traveler Elite. Once an override is selected, you have the option to change the permission for the overridden characteristic. 
which can be read only, read and write, or prevent. If you if read only or prevent, a custom display message for that override can be set for income for end users who encounter the control so they know exactly why they're limited or not able to use their device. And as, as mentioned, multiple overrides can be configured as needed to meet your organization's policy needs. So here is what a finished device control policy looks like. I'm just gonna walk you through uh, what is going to be expected when, um, when you um, put this policy into play. So. The default per permission is prevent. You'll see that in the upper right. Name and description for the policy is set as well as a local default notification message. There is an override rule set on the policy for encrypted devices, which is set to read and write. So with this policy, what we would expect is any USB storage device that is not encrypted will not be allowed. The end user will see a pop-up when trying to use an unencrypted device. The protect admin will receive an alert in the console that the unencrypted device was prevented and any encrypted devices will be allowed. The user will have read and write permissions on those devices and the protect admin will see, receive an alert that that uh, encrypted device was mounted. And the very last step to complete a device control configuration is to associate the de device control policy with your plan. Only one device control policy can be associated with any one plan, but the same device control policy can be set on multiple plans. This allows the flexibility to have different device control policies and plans depending on workflows, use cases within your organization. Putting that into practice, you might want a media or marketing team to have a more relaxed device control because of the nature of their work, whereas a customer support team may not need to use USB devices at all in the course of doing their work. With Jamf Protect device controls, you can set up plans and policies to accommodate both use cases. So first, the employee gives their own USB device a, a, a try. It is not in, encrypted. The endpoint is protected and the user is not able to use the USB device. They see their, the pop-up that it's not allowed with the messaging set up in the device controls configuration, they are not allowed to do anything with that personal USB device or get anything off of their computer. And then next, the employee uses their company issued encrypted device. Because the device is encrypted, it meets policy defined in Jam Protect so that the device is allowed and the end user is able to go about their work. All right, and lastly, in the protect, I just wanted to show you uh, a couple of the alerts that you might see. Um, when a prevent or read-only policy is configured on plans, you will get insight into users attempting to use USB devices. There are a couple of alerts that are relevant to device controls functionality. This is one for when there's a prevent policy and the USB device is blocked. You can see that it's an informational alert because in the severity, uh, there are no dots filled in, the action was prevented, and the status is auto-resolved. It includes details about the device, such as serial number, product ID, and vendor ID, which could be useful when you're looking to set your override policies. These details could be used to create further granular override rules by specifying that device or set of devices. If the device controls policy is set to read only, this alert will trigger, but it will display as read only in the action instead of prevented. And here, Protect also has capabilities to see file system activity related to USB devices. There are two analytics here. This one is USB write, which alerts when content is written to a removable, removable external USB device. It doesn't matter if device controls are configured or on plans or not for this analytic to trigger an alert. This is an additional benefit in Jam Protect's de detection capabilities, which provides visibility of file transmission from the Mac to removable storage device that has been inserted and is writable. Protect will log each and every file written to de the device providing important auditing data. 
There's another alert that we don't have shown here that is USB inserted, which alerts when a removable and writable USB device is inserted. Again, device controls do not need to be configured for this alert to, for this triggered, for this to trigger an alert. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to Matt to discuss how to choose options for your own device controls and things to consider when defining a de device control strategy for your own organization. Fantastic, thanks, Carrie. Uh, now that we've looked through why, would, why we would want to define a strategy, what is device control and what options do we have there, let's just uh, kind of work out how we best approach that. Now, I thought that might be helpful to review all three solutions that we've covered in, in a presentation through a brief summary uh, of the salient points for all three to help provide a higher level understanding of where and how they might need the needs of your organization. Now, again, please note that as, uh, as accessory security is still in beta, the comparison is based off of the information we have available at this time. And some of these details might change as uh, we move closer to that final release. So first of all, do each of these solutions support the latest Mac OS Ventura, which is going to come out quite shortly. Uh, we ran through it, MDM restrictions is not, so that rules that out as being used, but both accessory security, which is being introduced in that feature, uh, in that OS, uh, OS release, sorry, and device controls with Jam Protect will be supported as we have a same day support commitment here at Jamf. Now that's your brand new devices or your devices that are updated. What about previous ones that might still be running in your environment? And just to double down, uh, we definitely want to make sure we're still getting those devices updated as the priority, uh, but we will you know, often encounter uh, situations where that might take time. Uh, so what options do we have for supporting uh, the uh, previous two operating systems prior to Ventura, so Monterey and Big Sur once Ventura drops. And device controls has got you there with, side, uh, with Jam Protect. Now, next up, are the controls enforceable, right? Can we manage those through policies as an, uh, an IT or an InfoSec team? MDM, absolutely, that's the whole point of that framework. Uh, accessory security, we can actually do partially but in effect, you're actually uh, setting the control to not prompt, so it's perhaps not as desirable. And device controls works through the endpoint security framework. The users simply cannot do it. They cannot violate that policy with Jam Protect enforcing it. Uh, what are the controls like? Are they flexible? Uh, we ran through with MDM restrictions. We can do uh, read-only, lock, read and write. Accessory security is a little bit more limited, so I've marked that as red there. Uh, but device controls, again, you would have seen through Carrie's examples there that we can both be flexible on the default permissions that are enforced on drives, but also the override rules that we're able to create context from. Which brings us to that next point. How or what are the capabilities of, you know, implementing contextual base enforcement? And with both MDM restrictions and accessory security, where limited is what we can do there, there's not really a whole lot. But as we saw with device controls, we can build quite flexible rules there to cater for the different needs of your organization, particularly with things like encryption state. Is the volume being mounted by that device encrypted? That tends to be something that we, we, we hear from a lot of customers as an ask. Does this feature support removable storage devices? So MDM restrictions obviously does, device controls obviously does as well. And uh, accessory security definitely does as well. Uh, from what we know of so far, there's no managed block, as we said, so you can't enforce a block uh, and you can't, uh, from what we can see, get support for SD cards as it does appear to be uh, USB only today. Although it would be worth noting that perhaps an external SD card reader might be supported there. Now, do these features support mobile devices? Uh, we can get some of the way there with MDM restrictions. Uh, accessory uh, security can definitely be triggered uh, from, from our testing, uh, but again, no managed block. Uh, but device controls today only supports removable storage devices. So Jam Protect will not able to be uh, used to solve that particular need. Accessory support, can we, use, can we control or get uh, visibility of things like keyboards being inserted or things that are not you know, typical storage devices or mobile devices? MDM restrictions, not a whole lot there that we can do with that uh, media allow list uh, set of keys. Accessory security, absolutely. But again, there's no managed block. Device controls uh, is not, it, uh, do not offer any support for accessories today. 
Now, when it comes to alerting and logging, really, really critical part here to get uh, for some organizations that really need this for auditing or compliance requirements. Uh, MDM restrictions, not, not a whole lot that we can do there. Interestingly enough, with accessory security, it does appear that maybe some of the activity logging is written to the unified log. And, and again, that may change as we get close to release. But if it is able to be visible uh, there, there is a, a likely possibility we can actually use Jam Protect to filter the unified log to actually give us that visibility and stream that out to a data collection endpoint of your choice, like a scene. Jam Protect, as we mentioned with the device con uh, controls feature, will also provide visibility uh, of both insertions, file rights, and policy enforcement. And finally, what options do we have to customize in the end user communication that gets sent out to those devices and the users on them when a policy is enforced? With both MDM restrictions and accessory security, we don't have any customization, uh, but with device controls with Jam Protect, we can define the messaging that gets put out there in an effort to ensure that if we do enforce something and we do potentially limit productivity, we can at least guide the user in the right direction to then get the help that they need to return back to a productive state. Finally, uh, let's talk about you know, some kind of critical things or critical questions that you might want to ask yourselves when you're actually looking to define your own uh, device control strategy. So using the information we covered earlier in the presentation, a useful first step is to consider what are you or should you be most concerned about when it comes to risk? Is your organization or industry perhaps more concerned with data being exfiltrated than say another? Or is the greater risk likely to be something malicious being introduced? Or if all types of risk are you know, of paramount concern, then it may prove useful to perhaps prioritize and tackle them one by one with defined goals on mitigating them. It's also important to note that other controls and solutions uh, you may or may not have in place can also play a role here. For example, having antivirus, anti-malware deployed to your endpoints, a solution that provides that capability, is another critical line of defense against malicious files that should absolutely be investigated and should be deployed. Some other factors that will impact the strategy and help you design it are really knowing what the most common device types are that are used in your environment. Jamprotect can already provide visibility into all USB insertions today. Uh, and we're looking at how we can actually add more value here in the future from a product perspective. Uh, but in general, knowing your devices helps you to understand your risk profile. It also helps to understand the policies that you'll need to create, what the right solution and solutions to do so are, and how you can go about keeping those policies up to date as device use fluctuates throughout a life cycle. Say a user brings in a new device that you perhaps do want to permit, what is the workflow for going about updating that policy to ensure that they can? Now, an absolutely key consideration is finding that right balance between security and end user experience, ensuring that the controls put in place and how, they how they're delivered are both achieved in a way that reduces friction for users where possible, uh, but also still preserves that fantastic end user experience users have come to know and love from their Macs. As an example, it's, it's helpful that if we block a device that we also give users direction how else to complete their goals to ensure that they can still get their work done. Finally, as we mentioned earlier, some organizations will have high uh, requirements around visibility and logging of these sorts of events. So it is important to consider is the solution that you're planning or is the strategy that you're putting in place going to provide an account for that? Uh, so we're going to end things there. Thank you very much for paying attention and spending the time with Carrie and I to learn a little bit more about how we can mitigate risk with device controls on Mac. Uh, we are super excited to kind of learn more about what we can do in this space in the future. So please reach out to Jennifer if you do have any, any kind of questions or any sort of need that we aren't meeting with the existing uh, features and capabilities today. We'd love to hear from you and we'd love to learn. Uh, and we hope you have a great and fantastic rest of Jane Up 2022.